The Mediterranean Basin, 2nd century AD, the most powerful era of the Roman Empire. There is perhaps no symbol more characteristic of the strength of Imperial Rome than the majesty of its architecture. The Roman Empire at its height dominated three continents, 20 races, and more than 500 great cities. And once they conquered, they built. Roman-style architecture can be found from Italy to Spain, France to Asia Minor, Africa to the Black Sea. The cities were all built in the same grand style. Columns, porticos, markets, temples, basilicas. The Roman Empire unified the entire Mediterranean basin, encompassing lands where many civilizations had flowered, uniting them into one sole civilization with the same laws, the same way of life, the same customs. A single great multi-ethnic population that did not discriminate against its subjects for the color of their skin, and which had as emperor Italians, Europeans, Africans, and Arabs. To understand how Rome could build such a vast empire and then govern it for almost a thousand years, we will journey to the extreme outskirts of the Roman Empire at the time of its greatest expansion and learn the secrets that archaeology has uncovered for us. Rome was founded, according to legend, by Romulus in 753 BC. It began its expansion almost immediately, first conquering the lands of the Italian peoples, and then extending its domain until an empire was created that stretched from the Atlantic coasts of Iberia all the way to the Euphrates River. Historians date the fall of the Western Roman Empire to 476 AD, meaning that the history of this city and its dominion over the world spanned an entire millennium. How was it able to last so long? The answer is, Rome not only conquered lands, it adopted them, blending the customs and habits of various civilizations with the best that Rome had to offer. In vaison la romaine France, once a Roman province known as Gaul, archaeologists uncovered this paved road bordered by impressive buildings. At its entryways, the researchers noticed some strange grooves. What were they for? When presented with a puzzle like this, archaeologists often find important clues in ancient architectural writings preserved by medieval scribes. In the case of vaison la romaine the mystery was solved. The grooves in the thresholds supported wooden tables where merchants displayed their goods. By positioning the tables along the roadway, merchants enjoyed maximum visibility for their products and therefore had more success. This emphasis on marketing and commerce was one of the reasons why the empire remained vital for so long. Wherever the Romans arrived, weapons were laid down eventually, and the Pax Romana, or Roman peace, took their place. Within this context of renewed stability, business was able to thrive. Eventually, after Rome had invaded and inhabited a new land, it would take the best soldiers of that country and incorporate them into its own army. The best of these recruits would have come from wealthy families. They were usually better educated and trained, with natural aspirations to rise through the system of their new ruling government. If they succeeded in battle and the political aspects of war, they might have the chance to become senator 
one of the highest and wealthiest positions in the empire. A military career was the fastest route to furthering one's career. Of course, the new soldiers had to start at the bottom. They would be sent to battles in the easternmost borders of the empire, where Emperor Trajan was fighting the formidable Parni, the heirs of the Persians. From France, they would embark with a small military fleet on a voyage from Massilia, now Marseille, to Sicily, and forced to fight pirates along the way. From Sicily, the voyage would continue to the Orient, following the fastest and safest route possible. This meant following the coastline and only crossing open sea where necessary. The fleet would thread its way across the Aegean through the Peloponnesus to reach the port of Laodicea in Syria. Warships at that time were a lot different than merchant ships. This boat is called a trireme. We know how it looked because of information from relics recovered by marine archaeologists. They discovered that in order to be able to make quick maneuvers in battle and ram the enemy, warships were propelled by several layers of oarsmen. Merchant ships, on the other hand, used sails and had no oars. Warships were classified by the number and arrangement of oarsmen. The trireme had three tiers of oars, and each oar was manned by two oarsmen. It was a lightweight fighting ship, about 115 feet long, and perfect for hunting pirates because it was fast and agile. Naval soldiers manned the ship together with the oarsmen and were there to board enemy ships. Each trireme had a crew of about 300 oarsmen and 100 naval soldiers. To rid the vast waters of the Mediterranean and the Aegean of pirates, the fleet would often give chase, sometimes for hundreds of miles, to catch its enemy. Once caught, the tactic was not to board the enemy's ship and engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat, but to sink it, either by ramming it or hitting it with catapult fire. A ship-positioned broadside exposed itself to a greater risk of being rammed and sunk than its attacker, but that position offered advantages for the use of its catapult. This is because the rolling waves had two different effects on the arc of the projectiles. The defending ship catapult, positioned perpendicular to the main axis, hurled projectiles that fell inside an elongated ellipse, a form which corresponded perfectly to the shape and position of the attacking ship. The attacking ship, on the other hand, had its catapult aligned with its main axis and its projectiles tended to fall within a circle that encompassed only a minimal part of the target ship. Oftentimes, the attacker's missiles missed their target and the tides of battle would shift. A soldier's life was not all war. Roman culture demanded a certain refinement and taste among its subjects. This theater in Tyndaris is on the northeast coast of Sicily, overlooking the sea, where many voyagers and soldiers stopped on their journeys. What is both striking and intriguing about this structure is not so much its architecture or finishings, but rather its location. It is stunning, but it lacks a logical explanation. Having a theater exposed to the sea winds and the full sun, since the shows were offered during the daytime, seemed to be a very questionable choice. Other theaters, such as the very steep one in Pergamum, Turkey, had sweeping horizons to look out onto. That was what Hellenic tastes demanded. Every architectural work had to have something magnificent about it. The Tyndaris Theater, like much of the city, was not actually built by the Romans, but rather by the Greeks several centuries earlier during the Hellenistic era. The Romans simply absorbed it into their empire. One of the reasons for the size and strength of the Roman Empire was its assimilation of Greek culture, which was imitated and developed even further, as in the art of mosaics, and then spread throughout the empire. In the interior of Sicily was a flourishing city, Morgantina. 
sumptuous dwellings adorned with splendid mosaics testify to its wealth. One of the ways it demonstrated its prosperity was the gracious hospitality offered to strangers. We see evidence in this mosaic which contains the Greek phrase, be well, which may be taken as a sort of welcome. All citizens of the empire were equal. People and ideas were allowed to circulate freely, as were goods. The governor of the island, as well as its year-round inhabitants, would extend the celebrated Roman hospitality to all visitors, offering wine, meat, and all the produce of the fertile Sicilian soil part of the Italian terra firma, a land that Virgil called an earthly paradise, mighty mother of crops and mother of men. Sometimes an army's mission was not of war, but of peace. On the Greek island of Santorini was an early settlement called Thera, Thera was located in an area that was always at risk for earthquakes. Half of the island disappeared into the sea in the second millennium BC. The archaeological remains of Thera show that the city was rebuilt several times because it was hit by an earthquake more than once. The earthquakes would seriously damage public and private buildings, and on occasion, the Roman army would be assigned to carry out civil engineering projects, digging wells, clearing roads, restoring hygiene. An army officer could distinguish himself further by performing these public duties in a successful fashion. Moving further east, Toward the outer reaches of the empire, we entered Jordan. Archaeologists working during the last century uncovered a beautiful city, Gerasa. They were quite puzzled to find numerous drain covers like this one bearing the engraved image of a dolphin. This animal is clearly associated with the sea, although Gerasa was surrounded by desert and far from the coast. What mysterious meaning did this hide? Excavation work revealed a very rich city over the course of decades and offered clues to archaeologists as to what relationship Gerasa might have had with water. One of the city's most important monuments is the Nymphaeum, an impressively decorated fountain. These channels in the paving stones serve to carry away the water. The city was thus laced with small rivulets of water. A sensational discovery emerged from the study of the grand colonnade that crossed the city. At the tops of the columns, encased in the architraves, there were water conduits. Gerasa had a complex water distribution system. The water that filled the streams during the rainy season was diverted, collected, and conveyed all around the city, where it was used ostentatiously before draining off along the various channels. This system was certainly wasteful, but that is precisely why it was a source of pride to the city. With its ample supply of water and its monuments, including this temple dedicated to Zeus built in a panoramic position atop three terraces, Gerasa projected an image of beauty and hospitality as befitted its status as one of the ancient world's most important marketplaces. The city was at the eastern border of the Roman Empire, an area of intense commercial traffic between the Mediterranean to the west and India and China to the east. Gerasa had to compete for commerce with other cities in the same zone such as Palmyra and Petra, and hence had to offer a wide range of quality services and entertainment, as seen in its two theaters, its mineral baths, and the stadium. 
Its hospitality is highlighted by this magnificent oval plaza, for which Gerasa is world famous. The oval plaza of Gerasa is a symbol of the Roman Empire. An imposing colonnaded avenue penetrates the city and ends in this picturesque plaza. It is clear that the most beautiful and important cities of the empire, even the more distant ones like Gerasa, owed their stature to the excellent routes connecting them. The plaza, or the forum, as the Romans liked to call the city's most important meeting place, was always the end point of a road. This oval plaza stands as a testament to the most important reason for the survival of the Roman Empire, its road system. The efficiency of these road networks could be admired today. There were postal stations, armed guards, constant upkeep of the surface, and over 75,000 miles of roads. Gerasa was the eastern outpost of the empire. From here, Roman soldiers would travel through dunes across a boundless desert and encounter a culture and civilization unlike anything they had ever known. The caustic people who lived in this area between the Euphrates and the Indus rivers made even Romans tremble. This was the land of the Parni, the heirs of the Persians. The Romans would be forced to call upon their formidable battle tactics to defeat this bellicose enemy. There would be five or six tribunes in command of several divisions. The tribunes would report to a legate of the emperor, the top commander of the legion. Under the tribunes were the centurions, an elite force of men who commanded the centuries, groups of 100 soldiers. When engaging the Parni on the battlefield, the Romans would utilize their well-established military techniques the cavalry would be deployed along the flanks. In the center, facing the enemy army, there would be four rows of infantry, with the centuries in a staggered array to close any gaps. The first to attack were the Velites, a light force that carried out swift strikes and then took refuge behind the lines. Next, the lancers advanced, hurling their javelins and then engaging in hand-to-hand -hand combat before retreating. And then it was the turn of the princeps, and lastly, the triari, armed with lance and sword. The attacks continued in the same order repeatedly until all four lines, flanked by the cavalry, launched the final assault. If they won the first battle, the Romans would face a much more arduous challenge, the siege of a city. The army would camp about half a mile from the walls, and would set these ominous war machines, efficient and effective catapults, upon pedestals. Catapults could shoot arrows, or when necessary, rocks. When the army laid siege to a city, they used rocks as missiles to break openings in the walls so that the army could invade. The rocks would need to hit the same point again and again. This was achieved by loading the catapult with projectiles of the same weight after carrying out several launch tests and choosing the proper position in which to set the machine. The rocks weighed up to 175 pounds and had a maximum range of 700 yards. In order to launch them at high speed toward the adversary's walls, the rocks were placed in a sack at the center of a rope tied to each of the arms of a bow held in tension by a system of twisted ropes. A winch drew back the rope, which would then snap forward and hurl the projectile when the ring attached to the sack was released. Along with the catapult bombardment, the Romans would use other war machines as well. The tower was one of their strongest assault weapons. Its sides were closed, but could be opened at different levels when needed. 
On the intermediate floors, there were catapults armed with arrows and rocks. On the upper floors, there were soldiers ready to make the assault when the towers were next to the enemy walls. On the bottom floor, there was the battering ram. When the wall had been breached, the Tribune would give the signal to his centurions to attack and make their victorious entrance into the city. With Trajan's victory over the Parni, the Roman Empire reached its greatest expansion. A well-decorated officer could return home and follow the cursus honorum, the way of honor, a strictly regimented Roman ladder of promotion. With the right battle honors, they could win a much desired senatorial appointment and sit in on the empire's most important assembly. Roman senators were fighters too, but in a different way. They would use weapons of diplomacy, equitable application of law, and wise economic and political administration to maintain the stability of all that the army had achieved. The empire was an immense domain that encompassed the entire known world at the time. The legacy was one of the most powerful in world history.